right, I think we got a good group here. So we will go ahead and get started. Um, we will record this presentation. So if anybody's joining a little later, we can send that out. And we'll also send out the slide deck. So you can feel free to share that with colleagues, anybody you think that uh, could gain something from this presentation. So a couple housekeeping things first before we get started. Um, if you have any questions, if you look at the bottom panel of your screen, you have a little section called Q&A. Feel free to shoot questions in there at any point throughout the presentation or the chat panel also down there. Feel free to add comments, anything that you have to add. We would love to hear from you throughout the presentation. Uh, we will answer questions throughout if they're timely or we'll hit all those at the end if that's better. All right, so with that, I will introduce our speakers today. So first we have Patrick McGovern. He is the Director of New Business Development at Acedia, and he will be talking to us here at the beginning of this presentation today. He's uh, very knowledgeable. I've heard multiple presentations from Patrick, so okay. always enjoy listening to you speak, Patrick. And then we have Marge, Mercy, Marge Murphy. She is the President of Acadia. She will be rounding out our presentation today. Again, very knowledgeable, great presenter as well. So without further ado, uh, we are going to shut off our cameras to save a little bandwidth, and then I will hand it off to Pat to get us started. All right. Uh, thank you so much, and thanks everybody for attending. Um, I'm excited about this. This is uh, this is a good one. Uh, there's a, I think a lot of good stuff in here. Um, all right. Let me just advance this. Give it a second to work. There we go. Um, so we're talking about the the, um, the the funnel and the flywheel, and um, what I want to do is I want to the purpose of my portion of this is to get you thinking a little bit differently um, about the funnel. And this is a construct that's been with us a long time, right? And many of us are aware of the ADA principle, right? The ADA formula, and it's still used a, a lot today, especially in copywriting. You, create awareness, you peak interest, you have a consumer decision, and then you move them to, uh, to action, right? Top of the funnel, bottom of the funnel, and move on. As you can see on the slide, then over to the right, you've got two areas, really marketing and sales that are helping to drive. Marketing is traditionally on the top half, right? Building the awareness, filling that funnel with leads, uh, driving some interest, and then sales takes over afterwards getting them deeper into the funnel, finally closing the deal and moving on from there. Right? So this is the funnel, it's been with us a very long time. My goal today is to get you thinking about something different. Whoops. And <clears throat> hold on one second. Maybe it's time to put the funnel to bed. Okay, rest in peace may be a little bit dramatic, but I wanna get you thinking about the funnel in a different way. And maybe this is a construct that's time has come, right? Similar to when the car came along, the horse was not as effective as it once was. I believe the same is going with the funnel right now. It's not gonna go away, but it's just not as effective as it once was. So let me start laying out and build a case as to why I believe that. Right? And let's start at the top of the funnel and talking about awareness. Now, awareness is a big area when we uh, talk about marketing in terms of, um, is my message getting across? Am I being heard? Am I breaking through, right? Well, today it's getting harder and harder to do that. Back in 1970, right? Remember those days? I do, uh, a much simpler time. The average person was receiving between 500 and 1600 messages per day. This is from Yankalovich who does tracking on this. Let's fast forward to uh, 2020 and that's up to six to 10,000 messages per day. We're getting so many messages per day that industries have been created and are flourishing. That sole purpose is to block the messages that you're receiving. Think about that. And even if these numbers aren't exact, the trend is off the hook. I mean, it keeps going up. And I don't think that's ever gonna go down with the amount of technology that's the way it's advancing. So it's getting harder and harder to just build awareness. And unless you're Google or Amazon, 
your budget is greatly limited. So you can't spend your way to awareness. You have to rethink. Second reason is more people are involved nowadays. Super interesting stat from the Gartner Group, which says um, with an average company of about 100 to 500 employees, there are seven, count them, seven people who will be involved in the decision-making process. Now think about that. As a salesperson, what that does to the whole process, right? It's not a straight linear line. I talk to a person, they make a decision, we sign the deal. People are coming in and out of the equation at all points. Hence, sales and marketing has to work much closer together in order to create a sale, right? So more people are involved in this going on. Again, this is a trend that's been going on. I don't see this slowing down. I see this continuing as we go along. One more. These numbers are bananas. Again, these are stats up here. Don't get hung up on the exact numbers, but just listen to some of these. 70% of buyers are defining their needs before engaging with the sales rep. 44 are identifying solutions before even reaching out. They're identifying solutions before even reaching out. 57 to 90% are on their way to a decision before connecting with the sales rep. Again, don't get hung up on the exact numbers, but the trend is more people, by the time they're hitting your website, they've got a load of information, they've got a load of knowledge that fundamentally changes the game for salespeople and how they react, how they deal with customers coming in. Now that's the customers that are coming in. Think about it this way. What about those who don't even hit your site? You didn't even make the cut because the content that people were looking for wasn't even there. These are the people who are finding you who decide to go a little bit further. Right? These are three key trends that are going on. And that's before this little thing called COVID-19. Show of hands, anybody heard of this? Right? So now that there's COVID, some real interesting stats have, have, have emerged um, that I'd like to share with you that, again, build the case that says, hmm, maybe there's something else out there beside the sales funnel. Spoiler alert on this slide, there is both some good and just frightening news here. 85% um, say brand names don't matter during times of crisis. 85% say brand names don't matter during times of crisis. When I was going through school, when I was learning marketing, when I was young in the trenches, I always thought that the powerful brand name was a weapon against things like this, when there is a crisis, when there is uh, too many things, uh, choices on the market, that a brand name, a strong brand name would help propel you forward. Well, looks like things have changed a little bit. 69% say they will purchase a different brand if their preferred one is not available. I think this applies both to the B2C and B2B sectors, right? If I can't get my product, I have no problem going down the road to the next person who can help me with this. And 30 to 45% would stick with a brand, a new brand they tried during the pandemic. 30 to 45, that's nearly 50% say, yep, I'll switch over. Brand loyalty is being hit very hard. Retention is going to be paramount going forward, right? So if you're an established brand already, you got some things to worry about. If you're a challenger brand trying to break in, there's some good news for you there. The big are getting bigger. Um, I'm gonna show you some examples that we all are familiar with, but I would maintain that across any sector, those top players that are there right now are just going to increase their size and their footprint in that specific vertical. The next slides illustrate what I'm talking about. Amazon is the pandemic for Amazon and 2020 has been a very good year. Um, shares of Amazon and Apple in 2020 are up 50%. 50%. Speaking of Apple, the first company to hit $2 trillion in market cap, right? Fun fact about Apple, it took them 42 years 42 years to reach 1 trillion, and two years later, they've made their second trillion. 
And Walmart is seeing huge growth numbers, especially from their e-commerce and pickup and delivery service, right? They got into this game and are really slugging it out with Amazon. They've made some really bold moves during this time and they're being rewarded. The big are only getting bigger and that pressure is gonna be pushed down and felt on both mid and smaller size companies. Again, I'm using examples here that we're all familiar with to illustrate a point, but I believe, again, in every sector, this is happening. Not only that, but there's more competition than ever before. According to HubSpot, the average company has about 44 competitors. Again, I'm not getting hung up on the, the number. It might be 38, it might be 49. What I do feel is that, talk to anybody, they just feel like they have more competition than ever before. Now, there might be a little respite in here because obviously with COVID-19, some businesses may have fallen off. So there's a slight break in the action, but that's gonna return, right? There is just more players fighting it out. And that's why we need to start thinking about something new and start thinking about the flywheel. So let me take a minute and just kind of go through this. And really from the start, if just looking at this, this is different, right? The funnel, you have a distinct beginning of the process and an end of the process. The circle is just more fluid. How the flywheel works is really you take strangers, you engage with them and turn them into prospects. Those prospects become customers and those customers become promoters. It's really there. That's where the magic is in the flywheel. That connection between customers and promoters and using promoters to bring in new strangers and to fuel the flywheel, to get it turning. That is how people and businesses need to start thinking about the future, right? Just a short time ago, I was talking about the idea of retention. Well, when we look at the flywheel, this is made for retention. This has got retention baked into it, right? And if we look at the companies that are really killing it, they are using a subscription model. They get the repeat customers coming back. Those companies are rewarded by Wall Street and are growing gangbusters. And the flywheel fits into that perfectly. Companies that choose the flywheel model over other models have a huge advantage because they aren't the only ones helping their business grow. Customers are helping them grow as well, right? You really have a word of mouth play going on here and word of mouth is huge in both sectors, B2C and B2B. According to the stat I've seen in the B2B space, 91% of sales are influenced by word of mouth in some way. Right? The flywheel helps build that go, going forward. Moreover, the flywheel is more comprehensive, provides a more comprehensive look at where your business is growing fastest and it reveals your biggest areas of opportunity. And one of the biggest areas of opportunity is with sales and marketing. Okay, remember this, right? We started the presentation with this and we had, the awareness, interest, decision, and action. You've got your marketing and sales. You've got a clear line of distinction between both, right? Marketing handles this end, sales handles this end. There's an age old struggle that keeps going on, right? Marketing, are you giving us enough leads? Are you giving us qualified leads? Hey, sales, are you closing those leads or what are you doing, right? There's an age old fight there, but as we see, from my earlier slide, where we're talking about seven people involved with that, marketing and sales need to be working hand in hand. So instead of two separate areas, marketing and sales need to think about this as really gears meshing together, driving things forward. Because today it's not about closing the deal and how fast you can close it. It's really about helping out versus closing the deal. And the flywheel, again, fits hand in glove with that. Okay. So at this point, um, 
I got you thinking a little bit, or hopefully I did, all right? I wanna switch it though, because I wanna leave you with some just ways that you can start thinking about implementing the flywheel, right? It's like, okay, Pat, you gave me the construct. I could see where you're going. What do I do next? All right, let's talk about that. Starting with the three phases of the flywheel, right? You've got your attract, which now is focusing on earning people's attention, not forcing it. Remember, this is key. Remember how many messages we're bombarded with a day, right? We're not gonna spend and try to rein that in. We've gotta earn people's attention, right? Because there's too much noise out there. Once we have that, now we're talking about engaging and really focus on the relationships, not just closing the deals. And then finally, after the sale, how do we delight them? How do we help them grow even more? What other things can we do for them to keep that flywheel spinning, to get that word of mouth going? Well, I maintain the best place to start that, the best, is by taking a look at your website. And why do I say that? Well, your website is your number one salesperson. It's certainly your number one marketing channel. And again, according to HubSpot, 97% of the people who visit your site are influenced in their purchase decision by your site. I think a lot of people intellectualize this and get this, but I wonder if how many people are putting this into practice right now, right? And I can understand why. I'm gonna to get to that in a moment. I still think a lot of people are in this set it and forget it mode, right? A lot of organizations have just, we've got a site, it's out there. When push comes to shove, it's just pretty much an electronic brochure. Talks a little bit about the company. You got a little bit about the history. Um, you got some of the products that we have, phone number, email, sort of thing. But by and large, it's in a set it and forget it mode. Right? And the reason I see that and understand why that is, is because that's what my sales team does. They build the relationships. They close the deal. They go out and talk to people. Right? With a lot of organizations. They used to rely heavily, heavily on trade shows, right? That was their sales and marketing plan for the year. We hit X amount of shows. We get the leads. We make the contacts. We follow up. We close business, rinse, repeat, and do it all over again. Well, sales, um, trade shows are gone, um, and they're not going to come back anytime soon. So if you're an organization that has relied heavily upon that, what do you do? Do you wait it out? Do you play out the clock? The big are just going to keep getting bigger. They're going to find other ways around that. My suggestion, invest in your site. Start looking at that as a way to help facilitate the connections, to help facilitate interaction, engagement, and use it as a key part of the flywheel. Now, I've seen a stat um, that the, nowadays the average site takes about 2.7 years, 2.7, so let's just call it three, three years before some major work is needed, right? So if you're under three, you're probably good. If you're over three, you still may be good, but you should consider maybe I need some help. Maybe the site needs updating especially in COVID with all the announcements and things going on here, you gotta be updating things on a regular basis, right? So um, maybe parts of the site are really working well. Maybe there's parts of the site, depending on how big the site is, that haven't been touched in years. So here's my suggestion, start with an audit. And a good audit is gonna look at really kind of four components of your site. Technical, content, heuristic, and SEO. Technical, very basically, How's your just site performing? Like, how fast is it loading? How big are the pages? And these are just some of the basic technical things that you just want to take a look at. Google will reward that or punish you if your site is slow. People will punish you by not visiting your site if it's slow. Content, when's the last time you've updated some of your content? Are you putting new pieces on there at a regular basis? Or if you hit the blog site or the blog portion of your site, the last uh, post that's gone up has been 2015. Right? There's new things that need to be 
put up there. There's new stories to be told. So take a look at the content. Heuristic is really just a fancy word for usability, but how easy is it to navigate around? Can people find what you want them to find? Right? If you're manufacturing coffee mugs, can they find that? Can they find the order form? How easy it is to use the order form? Right? That's all heuristic. That's all usability. And then finally, SEO. Right? What keywords are you playing with? How are you ranking with those? How does branding versus non-branding keywords work? You need to take a look at all of that. And from there, once you get that audit back, then you can decide, hmm, what happens next? Okay. So if I have done my job correctly, I've kind of got you thinking about the funnel. Maybe it's time, based on the facts that I've just presented here, to think about something different. And that something different is the flywheel. And the flywheel could help move your business forward and could really be that key link in sales and marketing using your website as really that, that conduit, right? that kind of connective tissue between both departments. So with that said, now I'm gonna turn it over to Marge Murphy, who's gonna talk more about the sales and marketing and how to move that forward. So Marge, I'm gonna give you the mic. <laughs> Thanks, Patrick. Oh and my God. Spotlight. Some of those statistics that you brought up are just like, I can't believe it. And the one I'm going to go back to is the one that compared 1970 to 2020. And in 1970, we were getting 500 to 1600 messages a day. And here we are today, 6,000 to 10,000. How can we manage? I mean, how can our brains even manage this? I think about it and there are times where I get to the end of the day and it's like, I can't think of one more thing or see one more thing. So to your point, you, we, we can't shout any louder. We can't out shout the noise at this point. We have to get smarter and we have to really think about what we're going to do to be able to gain connection with the prospects and the clients we're trying to connect to. So Bridget, I'm just going to ask if I have control. I do, but I'm going way too fast. So Let's go back to that whole thought of the flywheel and the funnel. So talking about shouting, if you take a funnel and you take that funnel and you put it on its side, what does it look like a megaphone? So yeah, we can't shout any louder into that megaphone at this point. We have to think about that self-perpetuating flywheel. We have to think about how we are going to continue to keep that flow of strangers becoming people who are then promoters of our goods and services. And when we think about this and we think about how this is all going to happen, this flywheel doesn't happen by accident. It has to be very well planned. And we really have to make sure that one of the most important things happens here. And that is that holy grail of alignment with what we call our client facing teams. You know, in the past, we refer to it as sales and marketing. But if we are going to continue to have people promote customer service, plays a really big role in this flywheel. And helping these teams work together really requires a very strong communication of what we're doing, what are the roles we're playing, and how we can all work as a team and have that excellent alignment going on. So breaking this apart a little bit, let's look at the flywheel on the right side. Let's pull that open a little bit and take a look at what we've got on the left, illustrating the teams and having one team on one platform is gonna help create the synergy required for the flywheel methodology to work. So if we take a look at these strangers and prospects, we've got our marketing teams who are bringing people to our website, creating great content, and really engaging folks who are looking for good information, all of the things that you talked about earlier, Patrick. And that really starts with having a great website, having great content, and being found. So your marketing team is working hard to do that. Secondarily, you've got your sales team that's leading up, and they're learning more about prospects. They might be doing some research to look at good targets in the B2B space. They're creating relationships and bringing those relationships to a fuller extent. And they're also helping meet the needs of the clients by helping marketing understand what are the questions that we're getting every day? What are people looking for in terms of information? So we can already see that it's not just 
information flowing from marketing to sales, but sales communicating back to marketing to let them know what are we hearing? What is, what is the crowd want out there? And then to further that, we've got marketing, we've got customer service people that are continuing to get customer feedback. And they want to delight them by providing additional information about new products, new services, maybe even great case studies about a client success, a customer success. Maybe they have a client of the month that they celebrate. There's all kinds of things that customer service can do to continue that engagement. So again, we've got one team with communication flowing in two directions, sometimes three directions. No longer is it the funnel where it's going from A to B to C, but these teams are working in unison. And that's why it's so important for everyone on these teams to understand the flywheel and to understand that all of the information that's being gathered should be housed in one central point of truth, one database. So irrelevant of what your position or your role is, you're able to go back in and see what happened with marketing, what happened in customer service, and what did that sales conversation look like. So all the more important, I really do have to say, having one platform, having your information accessible to all of these teams is of utmost importance. The other thing that it also provides is the ability to analyze data. When your data is in one place, you can analyze what's working, you can see where you're having successes, and you can figure out where you're not having success and begin to fix that. Gone are the days or individual spreadsheets. It really just doesn't work anymore. So for a minute, I'm gonna uh, take a deeper dive into each one of these segments because when we look at the teams involved, we also have to realize that in today's world, there are many different skills that are needed. Marketing is just not somebody who can create a flyer, hand it to sales, and maybe email it out. There are many more skills that are required of our marketing teams, and it's changing every day. So if we think about marketing, we have to have people who can write blogs, uh, be able to program landing pages, be very well versed in social media, might be running some Google ad campaigns, they might have to know SEO, and we also have to have content strategy. And frankly, guys, with all of the stuff that we do on a daily basis, and I, I read some of these descriptions for marketing people, and I think, oh, Lord, nobody can do all of that, because you've got to have multiple skills, and it's most likely not going to be just one person. Now, let's couple that with the fact that we have to have marketing skills, but we also have to have technology skills as well, because we're now working in the tools of the trade, whether it be Salesforce, HubSpot, Zoho, you name it. Someone has to understand the technology behind that. So if you are doing email marketing or doing videos, or maybe you've got some you know, uh, conversational bots that you use on your, your website, uh, forms that need to be done, there needs to be an understanding of the technology that helps you get your job done. So we really have to look at our teams with regards to what their skill sets are and then how they can use the technology to leverage their skill sets. The same thing with sales. You know, sales is getting more and more involved with looking at, hey, who's opening my emails? Let me have an integration with my Gmail or my Outlook. And one of the most important things for sales, especially now, is task automation. You know, there's so many people they're reacting to and there's different things they need to be looking at. Not every task is a priority. I've seen it over and over again with sales teams and I, I find it heartbreaking for them because they'll say, Marge, I have 37 million things in my task list. There's no way I can get to all of this. So how can we automate tasks? How can we help our salespeople be more efficient and more effective? And once again, they're interfacing with two new technologies. You know, one of the things that we find is, you know, using video. I don't know if any of you have experimented with using something called Vidyard, but these great little simple videos that you can embed in an email, and let's face it, video really does attract people. So using that type of a technology to enhance your, your outreach really, really works. They're also using live chat. 
So think of all the tools that the salespeople need to use. They still have to have their sales skills. They've got to be able to uh, talk the talk and be able to help people solve problems, but they also have to interface with technology. Again, we have to understand the people who can fill those roles. And again, customer service, very much the same thing. They've got to look at the tickets that are coming in, also dealing with live chat, and often, oftentimes dealing with conversation bots, and having the ability to use the technology to get into a knowledge base to say, hey, where did this problem exist before? How did we resolve it? Uh, once again, having ticket automation in place and task automation in place because these folks are dealing with lots of people and lots of information. So I really, really, really want to focus on the fact that when you're looking at doing this type of a flywheel of methodology, look at all the actions that are taking place and take a really good look at the teams and the skills that you have in-house. And that brings me to this page saying, okay, we've got this methodology, we've got these great teams, everybody realizes this is what we're going to do and how do we make it all happen at this point? So when we take a look at it for our customers, these are the real concrete steps that we go through and I really, really think that everybody should follow this, thinking about the flywheel and thinking about how to really make this thing hum. Identifying skill sets and understanding the input of information that needs to go between the different segments and the different teams. The director of sales and the director of marketing should be in constant contact with one another, as should be the people who fall underneath them. If you have inside salespeople who are then uh, reporting up to an inside sales manager and you might have outside sales reps reporting up to regional sales folks, all of that information should be available for them in that flywheel database. They need to be able to see what's going on with customer conversations, with phone calls, with marketing information that they're opening. Therefore, it's very important for all the folks on the marketing side to be able to communicate and interface with the people on the sales side of house, also including customer service. And let's face it, they're not going to have meetings every week, potentially once a month. It would be great to get everybody together and maybe the teams meet individually every week or every other week. But the key here is keeping the communication within the database within the CRM and the marketing automation system so it's accessible to everybody at any time of day or night. Identify, uh, I'm gonna go back a minute, and identifying the skill sets and, like, and, and, and educating everyone to where they sit, where their roles are, and what they're responsible for offers a tremendous amount of clarity. The other thing that it provides is really a great culture because clarity really gives people the confidence and empowers them with the knowledge to know that they can do their jobs and do them well. Also important is defining shared goals. Everyone knows that the sales team has a sales quota and the marketing team has to generate a certain amount of leads and this is going to lead to new best business revenue. But really identifying the numbers. If we want to increase by 10%, what does 10% mean to your company? Is that $50,000? Is that $500,000? And if you know that, you have to think about, well, how many customers does that represent? And if we need to get 10 new customers, how many new leads do I need to be getting? 100 to get 10? That information is critical. And as you begin to maintain all of your information within one common database, you can begin to understand those conversion points and really understand what you need to do in order to get enough leads, get enough sales, and achieve the shared goal of grow, growing your business revenue. So defining shared goals, and not just defining them willy-nilly. Hey, 10%, we're gonna grow 10%. What does that mean concretely to every department? And then how do we measure it? How do we track it on a monthly basis and see if we're there? And if we're not there, we can make a judgment. We can make adjustments along the way, but think about it. If you get halfway through the year and you say, oh my heavens, we're nowhere near our goal, it's going to be really hard to straighten that out. But if you do it on a monthly basis, you can make corrections and get back on track. Here's the big thing, and boy, Patrick, you always laugh at me about flowcharts, but for me, 
It all comes together when you sit down with the teams and you flowchart exactly what the activities look like. When leads come in, how does marketing manage them until they become sales qualified? What is a marketing qualified lead? What is a sales qualified lead? What is the trigger to let sales know that they have an action? And what if sales takes action? And they call them and they email them and they don't get to them. How do you put them back in the nurture pool? Because you don't want to lose them. How do you progress them if they are qualified and are interested? What does that look like in terms of putting together proposals and quotes? Where is that information maintained? Flow charting the entire process has really been uh, just a, a really significant, has, has provided a significant impact for many folks that go through this process. So I find this is, is really a key and I wanna do a webinar just on how to flow chart because it brings about great conversations and really does solve a lot of problems and a lot of disconnects. And of course, analyzing the results. Once you start to gain this information, you can really analyze. And when analyzing, you can also then correct. So tools give you the ability to look at your, your pipelines, your deals, your sales appointments and leaderboards. And again, allows you to make corrections along the way if you're not where you, where you wanna be. And finally, it's always continued improvement. Uh, just as your website is not set it or forget it, neither is your sales and marketing and customer service process. It's a constant refinement. People come and go. Technology changes. Market changes. So many things are in flux that you've got to revisit this on a, I would say, quarterly basis. Take a look. Have an off-site meeting. Get the teams together. What's working well and what's not. I can guarantee you that when you put good metrics together and you have good meetings that drive results. Everyone feels empowered to get their job done and that whole flywheel concept really comes to life. I've seen it happen, it's been amazing. It takes great coordination and great communication. But once in place, the whole idea of driving those referrals and getting those clients to promote you to others really does work and I can tell you just in the past two weeks myself, one of my clients came back to me and said, you guys have done such a great job. Here's another client I'd like to introduce you to. Because we continue to nurture, we continue to be in front of them, providing solutions, offering different uh, educational series just like this one, and it really has become a self-fulfilling prophecy. It does work, and it really is quite fun. So with that, I think we'd like to kind of open it up and um, you know, ask you guys to, if you wanna come off mute and ask Patrick or myself some questions, please feel free. That's what we're here for today. All right, thanks so much, Martin and Patrick for the presentation today. Looks like we do have a few questions here and if anybody else has any more, feel free to add them in while we're getting the first few answered here. Okay, Patrick, get yourself back on video there, man. Alrighty. Hey, you know, one thing too, I want to go back and maybe we can even throw this up in the chat pane. Um, ha have people looked at their website in the past few years? Patrick, you brought up a stat that was really important. I, I saw, gosh, three years. It's like, oh, yeah. Um, maybe you guys could just put up in the chat pane if you've been revisiting your website recently. Because yeah. I think so many changes, especially with COVID, um, people are really rethinking websites. Yeah, yeah. I, I do a lot of work, Marge, in the higher ed space. And I could tell you just from talking to people there that it's a little bit longer when they do a major overhaul. They probably, they probably don't look at that until about maybe four to five years. However, mm -hmm. um, higher ed is a real unique industry in that there are a lot of gatekeepers, a lot of people touching the site. So mm -hmm. a lot of content is coming up there. So probably... What I've experienced and what I've heard too is after about three years, it be, the site becomes a dumpster fire, right? Mm, you just yeah. got so many people touching it that it, it's, it just gets out of control, right? People leave coming into the organization. So, you know, three years is probably, um, it's like anything. It's a, it's, a, um, uh, it's a measurement, right? Look at it that way, right? As opposed to a absolute. Yeah. You know? Yeah, and to your point, you know, depending on your organization, if you have a lot of people that are putting things on there, it does become kind of kludgy, right? You start to bolt things on. Right. Um, so even just pausing for a minute and maybe just trying to fix a few things 
um, without doing an overhaul, yeah, but just for sure, like for sure, you know, doing an audit, you know, it's, yep. There's so many things going on right now that, you know, you're, you're right. You don't want to throw the baby out with the bathwater. So you don't have to eat the elephant all at once. Let me throw a couple more analogies in there. I'm sorry. <laughs> but the fact is you're right, Mark, you don't have to, you, you may want to look at maybe just a particular section of it. It may not be the whole site. Right. And there's always refreshing that has to go on there. Um, you know, but yeah. some of these things are little minor things. Other things may be more, major right right yeah. right yeah so bridget what did we get up at the chat pane any any information on refreshing websites like we have one in the process of continually updating our new website from a year ago it had been 18 years of no updates yeah wow that's so amazing. that's long that's long that probably needs an update yeah right right but <laughs> yeah and, and to the point even after launching a new website it's just continual I go back to the stat that you said, Patrick, and I, I've said this myself many, many times. It's your first salesperson now, whether you like it or not, everybody, even ourselves, like, what do we do immediately? We're Googling, I'm looking for whatever. And then we start looking at websites and we start looking at information. Then we finally pick up the phone. Yep. And maybe if it's a business to consumer, we don't ever pick up the phone. We just say, think, bye. I don't, I don't, right. I can't find the stuff I'm looking for. It's too, it just gives me a bad vibe. People make their decision on, it's like 0. 0.2 seconds yeah. and, and they'll make a call whether or not they, they, they have an opinion on that site based off of that. Right. Absolutely. Um, Absolutely. So, yeah, it's critical. And, and that website is really the hub for everything that you're doing then in all the things that I talked about, you know, so yeah. we're getting that sales and marketing group together. You know, we're sending people to case studies on the website, even as salespeople, you know, yep. the marketing folks have call to actions, download the ebook, uh, attend our webinar. Right. They're putting all of that together. So all of that activity that's happening through that website really provides that bevy of information that can help us really understand what content is being loved and absorbed. Do more. <laughs> right, right, for sure. I mean, it's become the lifeline as people are limited on how much they can get out and connect in person with people. The website has become that de facto kind of person that they can visit, right? They find out more about an organization. So yeah, it's critical and it's not going to go away. I mean, even after we, we get through with all the craziness, it's, things are just going to be different. And the, it's not like we're going to go back to where it was. It's just going to keep no. moving forward. No, and, and uh, to, the, to the point that you two made about the, the trade shows, um, so being in the, you know, working a lot in the manufacturing industry, boy, a lot of our clients got hit really hard with trade shows not yeah. being in effect. So their websites have become their 24-7 trade show, and yeah. some of them are even putting up like a little piece on their website that's like a virtual trade show where they yeah. can put products out there and they, you know if they have a big piece of machinery how do you show somebody a big piece right. of machinery but they can put it up on their website and with all of the ability we, that we have now with video they can show this machine in action yeah. um, so it's been enormously it's been a game changer for the way people are thinking for about sure. their websites and how they're going to use for them. sure so, let's just use that example Marge you've got a huge piece of machinery let's say you create a great video for that what if you put that behind a gated wall and said hey listen to see this information a little bit more you have to give us some information right now you've got a legion thing happening yes right? you do and now you start yeah. now you start moving right now you start being able to collect data start to be able to follow up on that all because you're starting to think about your site a little bit differently right because you have to you have to you do you have to yeah so anyway we're blah 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 so yeah right on. i know <laughs> so Bridget, any other questions that we have to address before patrick and i just sit here and be like old old home yeah. game. <laughs> yeah, we do have a few. And actually, we have one that we got from a couple different people. So how often should I blog? What's the right frequency for blog posts? And uh, follow up on that. Do you post the same blogs on multiple social media outlets? But I'll start off, Marge, and um, I'll, I'll start off and, uh, and then pick up on that. So that's a whoever asked that that's a that's a great question and i'm gonna i'm gonna start by saying this i don't have the exact answer on on how often you should post on that i don't know if anybody does i would say here look at it this way set a cadence that you can maintain that to me is more critical than saying listen i'm gonna blog daily weekly monthly and then within you know the first three weeks the first three months things just peter out, right? Mm -hmm. I would say establish, uh, definitely establish a cadence that you can honestly hit. And I would start off slow. Like if think about it in terms of maybe monthly, right? You could always increase it. If you've got a ton of content coming out, you could always push it, 
right? So um, that's I would start off slow and build and build up to that. In terms of should I use the exact same content, right? Um, um, on different social networks. Great question. I would have a tendency to lean toward no, not the exact same content. I would modify it a bit to fit those different platforms because they do have a little bit of a different kind of feel and vibe that goes with each one of those. So just a copy paste, no, but the bones of it could be similar, but you may want to tweak certain things throughout um, just to make it fit that, that, that place a little bit, you know, the channel a little bit better. Mm -hmm. March, go ahead. Any, anything you want to add on that? Actually concur with you on all of that. So, um, we started even ourselves with our blog, we started like once a month and then we went to twice a month every other week. We had to get into the cadence, we had to set a schedule and we, when we became inconsistent, we immediately saw a traffic drop. Mm -hmm. It's like there was a consistency there that just had to be yeah. and we proved it to ourselves, just be consistent. And with regards to the platforms, you're right, think about LinkedIn, LinkedIn tends to be very professional and you know, uh, you know, a lot of the content that's up there is, is very business-like. Sure. And you go over and you look at Twitter and it's very, very different. Or you look, look at Facebook and it's different again. So repurposing content, very much so. And even what we've done over the years is if we had a really good blog that got a lot of traction two years ago, we dust it off, we yeah. reframe it, you know, we jazz it up a little bit yeah. and then we'll also put that back now you know we let it go a couple of years before we do yeah. that but you can repurpose information so if you have older stuff that was good dust it off and spruce it up and it, it's another good way that you don't have to constantly recreate the wheel yeah. but um, there's an awful lot out there right now to be talking about in so many different ways so Mar Mar Marge I'm so glad you said that with the dusting off the old one because that's that is a killer app that I don't think enough people are taking advantage of so, yeah, yeah, that's and you go a really back great and you're point. like, wow, over the past five years, we wrote like 300 blogs. Well, we could go back to number one and see if it's still relevant. And if it's not, make it relevant and bring it up to speed. Yep. Yep. But blogging, cool. we found to be really powerful for driving people to our website. Yeah. yeah. And what did HubSpot say too? It's about the companies that blog get about 50, 55 percent more traffic. Yeah. Um, than those companies who don't blog and it's about 75 70 to 75 percent more sales again yeah. you know relative numbers but yeah it's still still relevant today so yeah. yeah that and video and I know we're not really touching on video but video is another important thing For that sure. we're seeing really you know when you've got yep. good video up there it, it helps yeah yep Bridget back to you again I'm sorry <laughs> no it's all good great information um, so a couple more questions. This one really for either of you. How long do you see COVID changes impacting sales and marketing? Do you think they'll go away? Do you think it'll be permanent? Um, what, how do you see that impact playing yeah. out here? Yeah, March, you go ahead. I went first, so go ahead. So I see it making uh, tremendous changes. Uh, I think everyone has realized in, in the industries we work in, it was still very much face-to-face. -face. Uh, manufacturing people still wanted to get out walk the manufacturing floor, meet with clients and vendors. And I, I had sales guys, regional sales guys say to me at the beginning, beginning of COVID, this is never gonna work, we're not gonna sell a thing, this is gonna be terrible. And the first few Zoom meetings were a little rough, we'll just put it that way. But they started <laughs> to get used to, hey, I can still meet with my customer over Zoom. And I think they've begun to embrace it. I had one guy say to me, I don't have to drive between Iowa and Kansas anymore. Remember, these guys spend tons of time in their car. And we're, we're talking demographic of, you know, male 50 and above. They were not doing this technology thing. Well, they have changed because they've realized that they can do five calls in a day as opposed to one because they're driving to Des Moines. Yeah. So it, it, I think it's changed that perspective. I still think face-to-face -face is going to happen. Um, I think it's also changed the way in which people are using technology. And this is not Marge speaking, but the Wall Street Journal posted the growth of Salesforce.com this past quarter was stinking ginormous. So yes, mm. technology is being embraced more, even from putting information in, you know, people who said CRM don't want to talk about it. It's ugh. all of a sudden, the understanding that when you have data available to you, and you are sitting remotely, 
You have power in your hands to make sales. You can see what's going on in your marketing automation. You can see what's going on in your sales pipeline. People are embracing it. People who said, I don't need that. I have my clipboard are now saying, nope, this is really, really helpful. So I don't think it's going to change. I think it's going to improve. And I think it's going to use everything we talked about today in terms of this flywheel and take it to the next level because there's less resistance. There was a lot of resistance to the use of CRM and marketing automation, by, specifically by sales. And now, maybe not so much. Um, I'll just add to that. Um, I think it's going to be, uh, I think the changes are going to be very dramatic for a long period of time. Um, looking back on, or thinking back on a stat that I, I came across, I think this was related to this. This was in the travel space, and I think it was related to hotels. Um, when the yeah. 2008 crash happened, it took some hotels about 10 years to get their pricing back to where it was prior prior to yeah. 2008. That was 10 years. Relatively speaking, that was much more condensed, um, you know, globally than what we're dealing with now. Right. Mm -hmm. um, so we're going to be getting uh, impacted a, a great deal. Um, then you start looking at certain sectors. Let's stick with the travel space for a moment. Mm -hmm. I don't see business travel coming back anytime soon. In mm -hmm. fact, if I were a new CFO at a company, I would probably be looking at travel and entertainment going, well, we could cut this by about 30% because mm -hmm. I don't see business travel. I mean, we've been living on Zoom unless there's a really strong case for going out to the coast to close a deal, do it over Zoom. Right? Yeah. So I think some of these things are going to be really, really impactful. And, and it, it's going to depend really on the, um, on, the, on the vertical that you're talking about. I mean, look at like yeah. retail, the, the dramatic onslaught that was happening prior to COVID. Now just COVID just speeding things up, right? We, we had too many stores already. Now we're going to have less of them. Uh, yeah. The restaurant business is the same thing. We're just, there was too many. So in those sectors, they're going to be impacted a great deal. But mm -hmm. let's take even a step back and look at people's just overall feeling perception about it, right? If things work out, like the best case scenario is we have a vaccine by the end of this year, that's very, very unlikely in my opinion, that happening. So let's look at spring, early spring of 2021. Right, so that puts us in, you know, a March, April time frame. Now you have to roll it out to people. Now people have to get the vaccine, right? So we're talking about 2021 still endearing, you know, still putting up with this, and that's spilling over into 2022 right there. Just like you know, just some kind of like real quick kind of looking out. So we're going to be dealing with this for a long time. And again, depending on the sector that you're in, it, it's going to be challenging. And for other sectors, this is a boom. This is going to be yeah. the time to make hay, right? So yeah. it's not all doom and gloom for certain ones. They're, you know, they're, they're like Amazon. They're growing gangbusters, right. right? The big are going to get bigger during this time, and they're going to take advantage of it. Right. Yeah, and being creative with whatever your organization can do. And, you know, I, I think about, you know, different folks that are, that are uh, on this call. Um, there's great opportunity here. Uh, you know, if you're a website company, I think there's great opportunity. If you're somebody who puts CRMs in place, you know, like we do, I think there's great opportunity. Uh, there's some very creative things that people are doing right now to create an online presence for ordering and shipping things. Um, we, we have a client that has a very unique platform for how um, medical companies order their scrubs. Wow. So, you know, they can go right online instead of having, well, no, you, you get the green one, size large. They've come up with a very innovative way so that these are shipped right to the nurse's house, the doctor's house, the, you know, the medical professional's homes. And in this time, that's perfect. They don't have to inventory these things. So they got really creative. And that's yeah. what I'm seeing, too. There is a lot of creativity. And, you know, my heart does bleed for the hospitality and the restaurant industry because, they are struggling to do things differently. And, you know, we try to support our local restaurants here as much as possible because, you know, they're such a great part of our local community here in Dayton. They, they right. give us that vibe, you know? Right. Right. So um, again, if some industries are going to be able to pivot and do things differently and others are just going to have to, con you know, continue to keep on keeping on. Sure. You know, the consulting group, uh, McKinsey, yeah. um, talks about digital transformation, right? And digital transformation has been around for years, probably 10 plus years, right? People have been talking about that. Well, now with COVID, I mean, the need to do that is gonna be measured 
literally in months rather than years, right? Yeah. You're just not, you're, it's not a question of, you know, should I be doing this? It's how fast can you move in that direction, right? How fast can you build up your website? How fast can you put in those things that will allow you, those processes that will allow you to order scrubs faster, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. That's yeah. the game now, guys. That's the game. Yeah, very interesting, really. And you know what we're actually doing, and I'll, I know <laughs> I'm going to have to wrap up here. We're actually having a great webinar with a woman, um, Carrie Hoffman, and it's going to be next month. I know it's on our on our website or it's later this month. And Carrie was the uh, CIO uh, of one of the divisions of Johnson Controls. Ah. And she has been a promoter of the digital transformation for many, many years. And she is just a very well-versed, lovely person. And she has a great presentation on digital transformation. And the research she's done behind it is absolutely phenomenal. So I wow, encourage everybody good. to check it out and yeah. come visit us when Carrie's on. <laughs> Yeah, that sounds great. So Bridget, here great. we are. Yeah, but Brad, we're, we're having too much fun today. You know? <laughs> Any other questions we should be addressing, Bridget, before we wrap up? Um, I don't think so. If there are any others that come in, we will follow up with you all after the presentation. Right. Um, we will send out the slides and the recording of the webinar and all that good stuff. Uh, Marge and Pat's contact information is up on the screen right now. So feel free to reach out to them if you need anything. Have Please any questions. do. Please do. Website questions go to Patrick. Technology questions about CRM and uh, marketing automation can come to me. And, you know, any questions you guys have, feel free to contact us. This is all about educating. We're not trying to sell anybody on anything. We're here to educate. And we just feel that this flywheel concept is so important that uh, uh, Pat and I really wanted to make this kind of a, a visible to everybody today. So thank you all for joining us. <laughs> Marge Bridget, thank you so much. Everybody Take have care. a great afternoon. Good selling. <laughs> so. Bye, guys. Bye.